Have you ever seen gravity? Have you ever seen an atom? Or seen an electron? I don't mean on TV like in a computer graphic. I mean for real. And I don't mean with gravity falling. That doesn't count. You're seeing something fall. You're seeing a book fall. I mean see gravity itself. I don't think you have. Uh, you haven't seen an atom or an electron either. And you haven't seen electromagnetic repulsion between two electrons. You haven't actually seen that. But you and I and most people accept these ideas, these claims, as factual. Gravity is a fact. Atoms and electrons are facts. Most people are w willing to grant that. And you certainly think of a wall as something that's real. Why? Think about that for a minute. Why do you accept these ideas as facts and walls as real things? What makes something a fact? Uh, I'd like to argue that it's consequences. Something that can be unobservable, we will be willing to accept as a fact if it has observable consequences. Gravity has observable consequences. The thing that gravity was invented as an idea for was to explain objects falling to Earth. But it came to be able to explain other observable consequences. The trajectories of planetary orbits around the Sun. And something that Isaac Newton, who came up with gravity as an idea, never even thought of, which is this idea of gravitational lensing, that gravity can bend light around stars and create these distortion effects that proves, as a consequence, that this unobservable thing called gravity must exist. If it has consequences, an unobservable thing is a fact. Now, what makes something real, like a wall? I'll tell you something. It, what makes that wall a wall isn't the stuff that's in it. And what I mean by that is this. A, a wall can't be real to us as a wall because it's made of brick or stone or wood or plasterboard, cardboard, plastic, or sheet metal, steel, iron, nickel, whatever you want to make a wall out of, clay. That's not what makes the wall a wall. Because things can be made up of all those substances and not be walls. What is it that makes it a wall and makes it a real wall? What makes a wall a wall and a real wall isn't the substance at all that makes it up. It's not the stuff itself. It's the nature of the structure of that stuff in relation to something else. The wallness isn't in this object. It's in how it interacts with other things to serve a function. And without those other things, I would argue, it isn't really a wall. You can't have a wall unless it's perpendicular to a floor and standing as a barrier between two sides. Without that relationship, perpendicular to a floor, stand it as a barrier between two sides. You don't really have a, a real wall. You can think of a chair the same way. What makes a, a chair like this a real chair? Well, this one has fabric and a little bit of wood in it, but uh, there are other chairs that are made of plastic or metal or all sorts of other things. Stone, some people have made chairs out of stone. So it's not the substance it's the relationship. It's the structure. The structure of the elements that are in relation to each other. You have a seat and you have legs and they have to be in the right place. If they're sticking out sideways it's not a real chair. And then you have a back sometimes. Sometimes you don't with a stool but usually you have a back and the back has to be in the right place. If it's in the middle of the chair it's that's not a real chair, is it? To make it something real it has to have all those objects set up in interaction with each other, relating to each other in a particular way, to serve a function, which is to sit down in it. And that's what makes it a real chair. The reality of the object isn't in the thing itself. It's in the interactions the elements make with each other. 
that's important because that's really a social idea. So a physical structure, I hope I just demonstrated, is an arrangement of physical objects and their interaction, the way they interact with other things. Well, we can say the same about social structures. Okay, social structures are arrangements of social objects and their interaction. By this, sociologists usually mean people and the objects that people create called, you know, groups and communities and things like that. And the way that they interact with one another, usually through communication, sometimes through belonging and affiliation. So what are some of the examples of these social structures? Well, you have your basic unit of a person and you get some friendships in there and you get, can get a circle of friends, right? Social circles. You can get a community group that you join, like the Lions Club or something like that, or Rotary. You can get a neighborhood. I have people I live near and we interact with each other as a neighborhood. You can get a trade association or a corporation or a union or a country uh, or you get something like the United Nations or NATO, which is across multiple countries. The interaction that those countries have with each other creates something called the United Nations. And it, it happens in a particular way. And the particular way that that happens is the social structure. And when we study social structures, we come upon things called social facts. And I want to say that these social facts are just as real as physical facts, what you might in physics call a physical law. There are social laws too, these social facts, and they emerge from the consequences that they have that we can observe for social structure. I'll talk about a few that you can observe in just a minute. These social facts, okay, Emile Durkheim, I have a quote there that you can read, but I'll put it a little bit more plainly, it's just a regular pattern in a social structure that has an impact on that social structure. A regular pattern of interaction in a social structure is a social fact. And it's one that is constraining. You know, physical facts like gravity and electromagnetic repulsion we tend to take for granted, but we should recognize they limit us. We cannot do whatever we want to do. Uh, you know, that advertisement wasn't true. We can't fly. We can't walk through walls. And the reason is because of those physical facts. They constrain us, and we have to operate within those constraints. Similarly, there are social facts. There are sociological laws out there. And there are constraints that we have to operate within. Even if we have desires, even if we want something really bad, our individual wants and desires have limits that they bump up against in sociological laws. And so for reasons having nothing to do with the desires we have, sometimes what we end up doing is limited. We can't do whatever we want to do. These social facts are just as real as the physical facts because they constrain your life just as much as physical laws do. Let me give you a few examples. Here's a social fact. Your friends have more friends than you do. <laughs> you may sometimes feel that way. Well, it's true. And uh, this is true on average. This was discovered by a sociologist uh, from the South. His name is Scott Feld the American South, and uh, he came up with this idea looking at a sociogram, which you can see an example of on your screen. A sociogram is a set of dots, which are called nodes, and they usually refer to people. They can refer to anything that it interacts. And then there are these lines. And in this case, the lines indicate that those two people are friends. Well, let's check out that pink dot, okay? The pink dot has two friends, the red dot and the green dot. Okay, two friends. But what's the average number of friends of Pink's friends? Well, all red just has one. So, 
actually pink has more there but if you take a look at green green has one two three four and the average of one and four is two and a half which is more on average than pink has pink's friends have more friends than pink has and this is a general trend which turns out to be true for most people in a social network which is a social structure of people interacting that's a social network and uh, that's a social fact and it's something that no matter how hard you want it to be different it's not going to be different it's a kind of a counterintuitive idea I think but I'd like you to try to think about why that might be the case and we'll talk about it in class a little bit next week here's another social fact also having to do with another network and another sociologist. This is a sociologist named Peter Blau, who is no longer with us, unfortunately, but he uh, was a sociologist at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. And he came up with this realization. Okay, His realization was that, let's, let's say you have a minority and a, mi and a majority. A majority means that there are most people are in that group. And a minority means that there are only a few people over in this group. So in this social network picture, which is the picture is called a sociogram, we have two reds and four greens. There are more greens than reds. The greens are the majority in this little six-person social universe. And let's say there's one tie between the greens and the reds. Well, for the reds, from their point of view, that means one out of the two reds has a tie with a green. From the green's point of view, only one out of four greens has a tie with a red. That's a lower rate of intergroup association from, for the greens and a higher rate of intergroup contact for the reds. In plain language, if you're in a group of, small group of people, you're going to have a much higher likelihood of interacting with someone in a majority. And the majority people, any majority member, is going to have a much lower likelihood of being in contact with someone like you. So what? It has a consequence, which makes it uh, a social fact. And the observable consequence is that uh, minority members in any society end up having to interact and negotiate with the majority culture on the majority culture's terms at the same time that they interact with other minorities. If you're a majority on the other hand, especially if you're a member of a big majority, chances are you're never going to really come in contact with a small minority or only a few people in your big group will. So you don't have to think so much about the interests of the minorities. This is an insight that Bell Hooks came up with independently, just thinking about it. But Peter Blau, as a sociologist, showed why that's mathematically necessary and it's mathematically true. That has consequences for how we live our lives, say, as Americans, where we have majority groups and minority groups, and we all try to get along, but we get along differently, and it's not a matter of choice. It's a matter of social constraint. Pure and hard math.